Hello and welcome to the next episode of When Tomorrow Comes. So this week we're doing a little bit of role reversal and we have Ian joining us, not as chair but as a guest. So Ian's provided his fairly honest thoughts on the white paper, the positives, his concerns. So he thought it only right he joins us to explain these a little bit further. Um, I would say this is a rare opportunity to give Ian a grilling, but actually he's usually up for a little challenge. Um, hi Ian, thanks for taking part on the other side. Yeah, I feel like a gamekeeper turned poacher, which is pretty good. It's normally the other way around. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's quite nice to do it the other way around there, isn't it? Well, from my perspective. Um, also pleased to welcome our wonderful regulars to the vlog, Ashley Cook from our planning team. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Charlotte. Um, and Dan Jestico from our newly formed Futures team. Hello, Dan. Hello, Charlotte. So normal fashion, Ian, can I ask you to kick off and give us a brief summary of your email and key themes? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's probably worth saying that the reason it went out as a blog rather than as a, um, a, a typical I see any Wednesday email is I'm very conscious that when you talk about changes to the planning system, uh, I will delight and offend as many people. Um, so it definitely is a case of sharing my thoughts and it may, may not necessarily be there shared by you lot and the rest of Iceni and certainly, um, you know, having just come off a, um, a session with the RTPI with a whole variety of members from public and private sectors, there's clearly a real divergence of, of views. But from my perspective, when I read the white paper, and I should stress, and when I didn't listen to what was said in the media, when I read the white paper, and then also when I listened to the uh, the commentary that ran alongside that from Christopher Kapkowski on the Have I Got Planning News For You um, uh, episode they did, it gave me nothing but confidence that this was an opportunity for planning to stand up purposefully and say, the world's changed, COVID has fundamentally changed every aspect of society, and that you know, if we want planning to be at the forefront of that, you need to be positive and you need to be assertive and you need to have some really pretty strong minded ideas. And I guess what I was saying in my article is, yes, we now need to hear what people think and we need to potentially consider change. But the risk is that through compromise, you end up with kind of nothing. You just end up with a damp squib, which isn't really anything that's different to what we've already got. Um, yeah, no, I picked up on that as a as a sort of prevailing message throughout throughout the article. Um, one thing I did want to uh, flag, but I don't know if you realised, but um, your first paragraph talked all about the colour beige, how it's non-offensive and insipid. But I noticed that your picture that sits directly next to that paragraph is you wearing a beige jumper. So I didn't no, wasn't right. sure whether that was, <laughs> that was. Um, I've been to balance up. out your bold statements. I've been stitched up as the usual. <laughs> but no, you made some interesting points. Um, and some, as you say, that perhaps might go across against viewpoints of those in a different part of the planning system. Um, but one thing that I picked up with a background, probably more in urban planning, is your difference between strategic and urban planning and how that system works. And I guess I'm more interested in knowing um, what you actually think the successful elements are, obviously, particularly in the urban side. And if we are ripping up the system, as it were, uh, why are we removing some of those urban elements? Are we not? Does the white paper actually include some of the successes that we're seeing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, in its simplest form, I'm not sure you even need a plan at all in urban areas. I think you could almost get by with a series of uh, standards and thresholds and requirements. How many projects do we work on, on, you know, in the urban environment where we pick up a plan, we go, it says X, Y, Z, we put a plan and application in and then we just wait for permission to sort of come out the other side. More often than not, it's all about engagement with the community groups, with councillors, with wider stakeholders. And there's a kind of a, a good old fashioned bartering system as to what you end up with on that. And by and large, I don't think that that part of planning is is bad because I don't actually think that we rely that heavily on the planning system for urban sites. Where, where I think it fails is that we've seen a succession of attempts to try and so-called improve strategic planning, whether it's through the 2005 changes under Labour, the 2010 Localism Act uh, or proposals with Cameron that followed through into the revision to the MPPF. And that tinkering actually hasn't improved strategic planning. 
So, you, you know, you end up with a system that is just permanently, it's in this perennial stage of review. Nothing's ever adopted. Nothing ever gets allocated. So nothing ever gets delivered. Now, that's where I think that there is a fundamental difference between where we are on urban planning and strategic planning. And it's, it's for the strategic planning sake that I think we do need bold initiatives and to deliver change. Um, Ashley, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that um, by working in a sense across the two, because in one sense you could argue obviously that the detail within the urban areas helps us uh, to get that permission through in a smoother manner, and whether you have any comments upon creating that detail, ensuring the details there, so obviously Ian in his article, his blog has picked up on um, the fact that that detail could actually ruin what's going on in the white paper. Um, no, but I think I think I do agree to some extent with what Ian's saying about um, you know what what is the role of the local plan in an urban area. I think that um, you know I work across a variety of different um, sites. Most, pretty much all of them are within brownfield sites, urban areas. Um, but the thing is that regardless of where that site is, many of the same principles apply, and those principles are okay. Well, you've got to respect the character of that area. Think about heights and think about prevailing heights in that area, and you know think about you know the standard policies in terms of affordable housing and unit mix and you know whilst there may be some uh, sort of slight differences between local authorities you know generally all of these same kind of good place making principles apply and like Ian said a lot of it then just comes down to you know how you then negotiate with the, uh, the officers and how you take on board sort of um, comments and views through engagement with stakeholders and with the local population um, and so if you were to then sort of bring too much detail into the fore then it may just muddy the water and kind of you know get in the way of things but I, I think that the, the part for me for means article that's most interesting is this risk that um the the change that's being proposed becomes diluted um, and I think that I, I saw that firsthand when I worked at MHCLG and, and we did the sort of uh, white paper consultation that then led to the revised MPPF and there were many, many um, ideas and suggestions and changes that were proposed that had come through years and years of sort of um, MPs um, kind of promoting different planning reforms to ministers and ministers taking them further or not taking them further. Um, but, but what we found is that, uh, you know, most of the time you go through this consultation process and what is at first a radical idea um, does become quite watered down and then um, is either introduced as something that is not what it was at first or isn't introduced at all. And then we're stuck in the same cycle of, um, you know, the next um, sort of government introducing radical reforms after radical reforms, but none of them actually end up being radical reforms and then we are just stuck in the same system that as Ian says does have some faults to it um, and we're, we're, we're never going to be able to fix them if that is the cycle that we continue to be um, stuck in so yeah I mean what 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 kind of has emerged from that I think is is what you need is a is a roadmap for delivery so you've got the, the, the you know it's like if you're building a building you set up with a brief then you employ a project manager to make sure that that brief actually gets delivered so if you're going out to build um, 100 homes and you just kind of leave that as, as and, and then you end up with um, 50 sheds or something like that, then you as a developer aren't going to be particularly pleased with the outcome. So you want a kind of framework in place to make sure that the intent of the white paper is delivered in practice with oversight from the authors of that white paper to make sure that nothing's lost, nothing's diluted, and that the bold and, and kind of ambitious plans for that delivery are realised in practice and that, that just takes organisation and management. Where, where I think we've got a paradox is if you think about some of our key urban sites which have been fundamentally changed because of Covid, town centres, you know a lot of us are working on town centre regeneration schemes, none of those schemes could even begin to come forward in accordance with an up-to-date development plan because even if an up-to-date development plan was 12 months old it's out of date you know, and you've seen the government have tried to uh, address that by changes to the use classes order. On those key urban sites, the best way to manage that process is sl sleeves rolled up, engagement with communities and local authorities, design-led, doing the evidence base and getting on with it. And then looking for the most flexibility you can deliver in that for rapid turnaround and change. Versus strategic planning, where because of the scale of the 
housing crisis that we're in, we're often having to think about planning for schemes that last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, which the planning system is hopelessly inadequate in addressing because it only looks for 15 years and tests things on soundness instead of whether it's a good scheme. And that's where we're kind of at a crossroads. On the one level, you need really quick, rapid change. On the other, you've got to plan for long term. And the current system just doesn't allow us to do either. Surely there's a role there and Dan, if you want to pick up on this, of um, data digitalization. Yeah. You're talking about outdated documents and there's a there's a space there for them. And also I don't know, Dan, if you want to pick up on um, the element of sort of resourcing that because Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, the, the first point that Ian alluded to there is being able to do things quickly and speedily with a with a sort of without sort of jumping through a load of unnecessary hoops can can be facilitated through increased use of data. So at the moment, kind of each local plan has its own development management policies. These are standardised so that you know everyone has to comply with certain daylight standards, energy standards, what have you. Then submit that evidence in a digital format rather than a, a 200-page report or something like that, and just and just let's have the results so that we can kind of you know um, develop our town centres, develop and regenerate, but much more quickly with with um, sort of less time taken, less resources committed to that. Now, if central government were to fund that sort of digital front end that would allow applicants to kind of push data into local authority databases, then that sort of snappy redevelopment in line with kind of national development management policies could be achieved a lot more easily. Um, and a point that Ian also mentioned in his blog um, was around sort of the different parties that are going to engage in this document and it being outside of necessarily the planning world and the benefit of that. And Ian and Ashley as well, I don't know um, if you have any sort of suggestions of who you think should be involved in that conversation and if actually you think some are being excluded and the sector has been ignored as part of this to date. Ashley, do you want to go first and I'll, I'll come are, after are you. Are you referring to, in, in terms of the white paper, you know, who's going to be engaged in responding to that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was interesting. Like, on reading it, I felt like it was very much targeted towards the, the sort of general public. I think, you know, that sort of opening question is, you know, name three words, you know, that, that describe, you know, that you would describe the planning system. And I can tell you, you know, they, they've definitely designed that question so that the public come back and say, it's slow, it's you know, inconvenient and, you know, it, it, it destroys, you know, town centres. You know, I, I feel like they, they've designed it to want this response from the public. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. I think that one of my concerns is that they're trying to engage the public at this stage in the process um, to then result in them not being engaged as much within then uh, sort of actually when you're submitting uh, development proposals at the actual planning stage. And, you know, obviously at the moment, the whole idea is that we should be getting the public involved from the very beginning of, um, you know, you considering a development scheme, making sure that they are very much aware and on board with the, the scheme that's coming forward. And my worry is that there's a suggestion that, no, you know, there will be a bit of front loading and community engagement and getting their views on um, what should be allowed and what the principles are in a particular area. But then when proposals come forward, there's less opportunity for, for that to happen. And that kind of concerns me slightly because I think that it's very difficult to take a view on what's going to happen in an area in a, a general sense. I think that each site should still be kind of, you know, considered on its merits and, and people should be able to get involved in that at that stage as well. well I'll, I'll perhaps answer it in a slightly different point because um, I'm keen to ensure that the task force continues to have a really important role in this consultation exercise on the white paper. Because I think if, you know, um, if you're the RTPI, for example, how on earth do you put forward a single message about the white paper? Because you have got to represent the views of 25,000 odd people and you'll have some for it, some against it. It draws you to a middle ground, to the beige ground. What do you say? I think this calls for really, really strong leadership and I would, if I could have one ask, it would be that that task force is kept together and um, continues, if you like, to hold government and MHCLG to account to ensure that the, 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 the ideals that are established in the white paper are seen through. Because I, I just think if you're 
if you're trying to represent a broad church of people, it's impossible to do anything other than compromise, which will take you away from radical change. Um, I, and I, I suppose I would just also say, I've always fundamentally felt that the that planning is for society, not for planners. And uh, that's, with, that's meant there's no disrespect to any of our planning colleagues, but I'm not sure that those within the industry are always best placed to comment on what you need for change. I completely agree with that as a statement. Um, it's always useful to have outside input, outside thoughts, um, make us think outside of our little bubble, really. Um, I'm conscious of time and that we actually need to round up. So I'm going to have one last question, which I appreciate normally we go to Ian, but I feel like, Ian, you've given quite a lot of I've said of too thoughts. much. I know. Sorry. So I'm going to go to Dan on this, even though I had it lined up for you. Um, oh, All right. Dan, you're invited into a room. Central government and the task force are sitting there. And you've got yeah. a minute to make a point about the white paper. What's your point? Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, I, would, I would say um, it's basically, it, it reiterating his point, is, is having the backbone to stand up and stay strong to the principles that are outlined in, in that white paper. I would say you basically need a task force to deliver it. Um, if you're going to set this out along the rebus stages of work, brilliant, you've done stage zero. Now let's work through stages one, two, three, four, all the way to the practical completion and operational efficiency and making sure we review the things, make sure it's delivered on the outcomes. And let's have a framework established to make sure that the right people are pulled in at the right times to help us deliver on the aims of that paper with that strategic oversight of the original authors to make sure that those um, outcomes are realised in practice and that we have a feedback mechanism there to um to assess track and monitor delivery of those outcomes amazing thanks Dan. good response yeah. um thanks ian and ashley also and for joining us and um, as we know consultation still runs still opportunities to submit comments recommendations so if you are now feeling inspired by these chats um do just drop us a line and um, thanks for everyone who's checked in and we look forward to hopefully some of you joining us again next week thanks all